Um, but yeah, I'm going to be talking about two things today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, collecting choice process data in field experiments and also working with research partners. Uh, so yeah, uh, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A or in chat. I think you can raise your hand um, and I'll get started. Now, let me figure out how to share screen first. Okay, do you guys see my slides? Um, is anyone? Yeah, we see them. Okay, and not my notes, because that would be not great. Not the notes. Okay, cool, awesome. Okay, I'll start. Um, so yeah, in my first talk today, uh, okay, in my first talk today, I'm going to talk about using choice process data in field experiments. Uh, so I'm going to talk go over what choice process data is, uh, the different types of choice process data you can collect, and discuss whether and how it's useful. Uh, so I'm going to end with an example by presenting one of my papers that uses choice process data in an artifactual field experiment. And the goal for uh, today is for you to walk away feeling like this data is more accessible and for you to be able to think about situations where you might use it. Okay, uh, so first let's talk about what is choice process data. Okay, so in economics in general, people make decisions and we observe the behavioral outcomes. Uh, so for example, an individual might make a decision on which door to walk through, uh, which jewelry to buy, uh, and groups can make decisions too. Uh, so for example, here we have a picture of a group making a business decision. And traditionally we've taken a revealed preference approach. So we usually infer people's preferences based on their choices. Choice process data is just data that we collect about how people make those decisions. Uh, so choice process data is not new. In fact, a lot of you might already be collecting some of this data uh, in your experiments. Uh, so for example, in your experiments, if you have, um, if you'll ever make a note about whether a subject is paying attention or taking an experiment seriously, uh, that's choice process data. Uh, now the technology is higher quality and cheaper than ever. So there is a small but growing embrace of choice process data in experimental economics. Uh, and in creating these slides, I found the paper um, Cooper et al. Uh, by David Cooper, Ian Krybeck, and Charles Nusser very helpful. Uh, so this paper introduces a special issue of the Journal of the Economic Science Association that includes many papers using choice process data. Uh, the authors have also been organizing a choice process workshop uh, at the ESA North American meetings for the past few years. Uh, so just to give you a disclaimer for where I'm coming from on this, I'm not an expert on, using, uh, on choice process data. So my background is I'm a pretty traditional experimental economist, and I've used uh, choice process data in a few of my field and lab experiments. So I'm coming at this very much from the perspective that these are interesting data to collect in an experiment, uh, and not necessarily as someone who studies the decision process itself. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the different types of choice process data you can collect. There are many different types of choice process data, uh, including but not limited to the following. Uh, so first, uh, something you might already collect uh, is response time. Uh, so here, response time is just the time it takes for a subject to make their decision. Uh, the interpretation uh, for this is a little bit tricky. Uh, depending on the context, differences in response time between subjects may mean that some subjects find the decision easier or that they're pursuing a different strategy, for example, a less deliberate strategy. Uh, you have eye tracking. Uh, so up to 15 years ago, subjects needed to wear equipment strapped to their heads, uh, really bulky equipment. Uh, now it's a lot easier to do eye tracking. Uh, so now uh, it can be used in video games. Uh, you can attach a device to a computer screen that tracks, um, uh, that can measure gaze direction, time, and pupil dilation, so intensity of focus, as well as the order of information acquisition. So you can get a heat map that looks like the heat map on, on this picture. Uh, you can do mouse tracking. Uh, so mouse tracking is like eye tracking, except you're tracking the subject's computer mouse movements. 
Uh, so you can install a tool called Mouse Lab, which allows you to put this on a website and run an experiment there. Uh, so in mouse tracking experiments, the experimenter can hide information behind boxes so that the subject has to click or hover over the box in order to reveal the information. Uh, so here you can measure subjects' information demand, uh, the order of information acquisition, so what did they look at first or what did they demand first, uh, as well as indecision. Uh, so facial expressions. Uh, so we can measure uh, emotions from facial expressions in pictures or video using emotion reading software. Uh, so if you look at the pictures over here on the top right of the screen, you could probably recognize some of these emotions. Uh, we have software to do that now. Uh, so if it's video, then you can measure emotions in continuous time. And you can actually now sync this with Ztree as well using a software package called MuCap. Uh, so you can get the emotions that are associated with a specific decision that a subject is making. Uh, you can do chat transcripts. Uh, so with chat transcripts, you can see how groups come to a decision. Uh, so you can see the thought process that the group has. Uh, and you can also see the influence and bargaining power that certain people in a group have. Uh, this seems useful to analyze, uh, for example, in experiments on advice giving or cheap talk. You can do uh, skin conductance or heart rate measures. Uh, these can measure uh, subject stress. And you can also collect brain activation data, uh, such as fMRI or EEG. Uh, and these can tell you which neural processes are activated during a decision. Uh, so fMRI, shown on the right, uh, uses a giant magnet to record blood flow to different areas of the brain. This gives you spatial information, uh, so different areas of the brain do different things, and this can tell you which area of the brain is activated during a decision. Uh, on the other hand, EEG gives you uh, measures timing and brain activity. Okay, uh, so here's another example for why choice process data might be good for measurement. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is a recently published paper, uh, published today actually in the PNAS. Um, and it, uh, it's by Troller, Renfrey et al. And it has been receiving a lot of press and attention. Uh, so the authors show that a monthly unconditional cash transfer to low income families can actually change babies' brain activity. So we care about the effects of early childhood interventions, but it can be difficult to measure outcomes from these interventions. Uh, so you have to wait until these babies grow up. Uh, we have to wait a long time before we can measure outcomes like children's grades or test scores in school. And intermediate outcomes from babies and young children may be hard to measure behaviorally. Uh, so brain activity can be collected as part of a set of measurements to evaluate a program. Uh, with John List, Anya Samek, Ali Hortaksu, Jean Decidi, and Keith Yoder, I actually have a related paper that finds using EEG that providing preschool to low-income families can change children's brain activity. Uh, so we find that preschool increases brain activity associated with children's non-cognitive skills. And furthermore, this brain activity is also predictive of children's non-cognitive skills four years later. Okay, uh, so now I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of uh, this data. Uh, so pros, uh, most of the choice process data methods on the previous page are cheap. Um, so for example, with response time and chat transcripts, these are really cheap to collect and they're easy to analyze. So there's a low number of dimensions and you can just usually download this data and plug it into Stata. The cons are that some of these methods are actually quite expensive. Uh, so for example, fMRI and to a lesser extent uh, EEG and require years of training to learn how to design uh, the experiment and collect and analyze the data. Uh, so for example, uh, my uh, neuroeconomics experiments, I've done these at the University of Chicago. And at the University of Chicago, there's a center in the hospital specifically for fMRI, social science and science research. Uh, so this has this uh, $500,000 uh, MRI scanner, which can only be operated by highly skilled MRI technicians, uh, and it costs a lot per subject. So for each subject, we paid $500 uh, for the scanner plus subject fees uh, per hour. Uh, you also need to collaborate with experts. So in my fMRI and EG projects, we've collaborated with psychology professors. Uh, so it's not the case that all studies benefit from choice process data. 
uh, most of the time an additional treatment or a survey is enough to disentangle mechanisms. So because this data can get really expensive, you need to be able to justify why you need to collect the data uh, in order to do it. Uh, so when would you want to use choice process data? So the benefits of choice process data are uh, choice process data can be richer and more objective, especially when the alternative is self-reported. Uh, so take, for example, reading emotions from facial expressions. The alternative that researchers often use is to administer a self-reported questionnaire to subjects in an experiment on how they're feeling at one point in time. So you can compare this to continuous time facial expression data that you can get in a video. Uh, choice process data is especially useful when, uh, for example, you want to disentangle mechanisms, but uh, two mechanisms lead to what looks like the same behavioral outcome. Uh, they're useful for when you want to understand individual differences and when you want to understand the underlying decision process um, that informs economic theories. Uh, so the cons are you actually, you have to design the experiment or task uh, where you're collecting choice process data very carefully. Uh, so you have to make a lot of design decisions, uh, like what window of time are you collecting the data? Uh, and you also have to try to shut down external sources of noise. So uh, this data can be very sensitive to that. Oh, there's a question. Uh, okay, when and how would you use the mass click data? Um, so let's go back to the previous slide. I don't know if I can do that with the chat window open. Yeah, and so with mouse click data, uh, it's basically like eye tracking, except you can track what this, where the subject's mouse is. Uh, so for example, you can look, um, sometimes your mouse moves when you're thinking or when you're paying attention to a certain thing. And so you can kind of see where subjects' mouses would be, so you can see where they're paying attention. Um, you can also um, kind of in, put on websites interactive things, like you can hide information in boxes. And so you can kind of force subjects, you know, if they want to get this information, they're going to have to click somewhere on a box. And so you can see what information they demand uh, in the order in which they demand it. Oops. Right, so it's just another measurement you can collect. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to talk about one of my papers as an example of an artifactual field experiment using choice process data. Uh, so remember in uh, John's talk from the beginning of today, an artifactual field experiment is one where you're bringing field experiment subjects into the lab. Uh, so this paper, Experienced Traders Modulate Anterior Insula to Reduce the Endowment Effect, um, is with Lester Tong, Kintara Sai, Sida Urtach, uh, John List, Howard Nisbaum, and Ali Hurtaksu, and it was published in PNAS in 2016. Uh, so earlier today, we had a nice discussion about how different types of experiments are complements with each other. Uh, so the literature on the endowment effect is a really nice example of this. This literature moved from lab experiments uh, to framed field experiments, and then to artifactual field experiments with this paper. Uh, so we start out with lab experiments. Um, these are very well-known lab experiments. Uh, the endowment effect is a well-known behavioral anomaly where people demand a greater price when selling goods that they own than they would pay to purchase the same goods. Uh, so this is an anomaly because in standard utility theory, we don't think about whether you own an object, whether, uh, we don't think whether you own an object affects your valuation of it. Uh, for example, in a seminal paper by Kahneman, Nash, and Thaler, the authors ran a series of lab experiments where they randomly gave a mug to half their subjects. Uh, so those with a mug were sellers, and they were asked how much money they would be willing to accept to part with the mug. Those without a mug were buyers, and similarly, the experimenters asked for their willingness to pay to buy the mug. While random assignment ensures that both groups should ex ante value the mug similarly, the authors found that being given the mug caused sellers to value the mug much more. So this is a behavioral explanation for why markets don't clear necessarily. And it's mostly observed with consumption goods. Uh, so this literature moved to framed field experiments 
uh, John took this to the field. Uh, he went to uh, sports card shows, uh, and he went to a sports card show with two goods. Uh, so good A was a Kansas City Royals games ticket stub dated June 14th, 1996, uh, which was issued for admission to the baseball game in which Cal Ripken Jr. broke the world record for consecutive games played. Uh, and good B is a dated certificate commemorating the game in which Nolan Ryan achieved what only 20 previous uh, baseball players had done, winning 300 games. So John uh, went to the sports card show and asked dealers and non-dealers there to fill out a short survey. If they agreed, he gave them randomly one of the two goods. At the end of the survey, uh, John retrieved the other good from under the table and asked subjects if they would like to trade for the other good. So in a few experiments, John showed that the endowment effect is muted amongst sellers with market experience, which, which suggests that maybe the endowment effect is not so much of a problem in real markets. So this paper that I'm going to present today and tries to answer why. What makes experienced sellers different than other people? And why is it that when you take the endowment effect to the field, you don't necessarily find it? Okay, so this paper brought experienced and inexperienced sellers back to the lab in an artifactual field experiment. So in order to answer this research question, we scanned and compared the brains of experienced and inexperienced sellers using fMRI. Uh, so first we designed a buying and a selling computerized task that subjects would do in the MRI scanner. And then we recruited experienced and inexperienced sellers to come to the fMRI scanning center at UChicago. So we scanned their brains while subjects made a series of real buying and selling decisions for consumer goods. Uh, so you can see the task on the top right over here. Uh, they basically made a series of real buying and selling decisions uh, that looked like the following. So we showed them goods with uh, a distribution of prices, and we asked them whether they would be willing to part with uh, for the selling task or willing to buy for the buying task the good at the following price, and they had to choose accept or reject. So we're looking at subjects' brain activity when they do that. And we have two hypotheses for why experienced sellers and inexperienced sellers might be different. Uh, so one was it could be that experienced sellers experience less reward when valuating consumer goods. So they have more stable valuations, and that's why they don't exhibit as much endowment effect. If this is the case, we would expect a difference in nucleus accumbens and orbitofrontal cortex brain activity, which are the areas associated with reward processing. Or it could be that experienced sellers experience less loss when selling consumer goods. Uh, so that means that the endowment effect is driven by loss aversion. Um, and the difference between experienced sellers and inexperienced sellers is that experienced sellers don't feel as much loss. Uh, if so, we would expect a difference in the right anterior insula, which is an area associated with pain or loss. So we did two experiments. In the first experiment, we recruited both experienced sellers and inexperienced sellers to our fMRI lab, where the in inexperienced sellers were UChicago staff, and the experienced sellers were traders all around Chicago. Uh, so we found that the experienced sellers did not exhibit as much endowment effect as predicted. We also found that there were differences in brain activity between the two groups. So the experienced sellers experience less insula activity during selling, meaning that they experience less pain or loss. So the experienced sellers just didn't feel as bad when they were parting with objects and selling them. And this difference between experienced and inexperienced subjects was especially pronounced for lowball or unfair offers. Uh, you can see this in the picture on the right. With fMRI, we're recording blood flow in different areas of the brain. So the brain is split up into about 100,000 tiny voxels. Uh, voxels are 3D versions of pixels. And we ran a t-test on each voxel to compare the, the experienced and inexperienced subjects. Uh, with multiple hypothesis testing corrections, of course. Uh, so the picture shows these statistically significant voxels lit up. So th these are the areas where the experienced and inexperienced subjects were different. 
Okay, so we found that the experienced sellers really did differ from inexperienced sellers in their pain loss brain activity during selling. However, this is not necessarily a causal relationship. It could be that people who don't feel as bad during selling are more likely to select into a selling profession. Uh, so in the second experiment, we recruited a completely inexperienced group of sellers to our fMRI lab to participate in the experiment. So here we wanted the selling experience to be exogenous. So at the time, I was really into vintage and antique markets. So we went to a lot of these markets and walked around recruiting consumers with zero selling experience. And we asked them to come do our fMRI experiment two times, two months apart. So here, all subjects started out with zero selling experience. And we randomly assigned the inexperienced sellers into either a treatment or a control group. In between the two fMRI sessions, we tried to train the treated subjects to become expert sellers on eBay. So we shipped a box of goods to them, of consumer goods from these vintage and antique markets. Uh, so we knew they liked the goods. And we incentivized them to sell the goods on eBay using lottery tickets. Uh, so we had RAs write a guide on how to sell things on eBay. And we gave people lottery tickets uh, for selling the goods. So every good you sold uh, got you some lottery tickets. And you could even go beyond the box. And you could look around your house for any item you sold. Additionally, we would also give people lottery tickets. Um, so we followed the subjects on eBay, really incentivized them to sell. And by the end of the two months, some of these people really became active eBay sellers. Then we scanned the treatment and control groups. Uh, and this time, even though selling experience was exogenous, we still found the same result, that the experienced sellers actually had different brain activity, and they experienced less insulin activity during selling compared to the inexperienced sellers. So what did we learn from these two experiments? We learned that the endowment effect is driven by loss aversion. So when regular people like you and me sell items, we feel very bad uh, because we're parting with items. Um, and so this causes us to demand a high price or willingness to accept to part with them. However, experienced sellers actually become desensitized so that they don't feel bad when they're selling, possibly because they have a different reference point uh, and they already expect to lose the item. Furthermore, we found that we could train a completely inexperienced group of sellers to change their brain activity during selling. Uh, so we could actually change people's brains uh, over the course of only a short period of time, two months. Um, so I'll take uh, some questions here and then I'll switch over to my next topic, which is uh, working with research partners. Okay, so I've got a question. If a treatment requires participants, to complete an action plan, form an implementation intention, asking questions on how, why, and when they will take action in the future. Could this qualitative data also be described as trace process data? I'm not actually sure how you would classify this. Uh, trace process data is really data on how people make choices. Um, it sounds like it could be, uh, it could be choice process data. Um, and it could be interesting data to look at as well. Okay, uh, if you guys don't have any other questions, um, I'm gonna move on to the next lecture on working with research partners. Okay, okay I'm gonna have to switch slides. Let me see how I can do this. Okay, okay, so we're switching gears. Uh, now we're going to talk about how to work with research partners, uh, either private or public institutions. Um, so I want you guys to ask questions here. Um, this lecture is given from an academic point of view. 
Uh, and there are some people here, I think, at least uh, from the registration form, that are from outside of academia. Uh, so feel free to suggest ways in which academics can partner with uh, practitioners. Um, feel free to also uh, post in the chat who you are and where you're from if you, if you have access to the chat. Okay, let's start. Okay, so here's an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to select a good research partner. Um, that's often a very important step. How to convince them to work with you once you've selected a good research partner. Uh, how to design an experiment together with your research partner. And how to communicate with them and stay organized and on track for your field experiment. Uh, so I want to give credit to Anya Samek and Rob Metcalf, who have given previous versions of this talk at the Chicago Summer Institute on Field Experiments. Uh, so I've used uh, some things from their previous slides as well. Okay, so working with research partners is a little bit of an art. Uh, it can be really rewarding. Uh, research partners can really help you achieve a big impact in a natural setting. But that depends on having a successful research partnership. Uh, often without the research partner, there is no field experiment. And this is actually a pretty hard uh, thing to do, especially for junior researchers. So how do research partnerships come about? Uh, in my own experience, they've come about in two ways. Um, so the way that you usually think of when you design an experiment is you think, I have an, a research question, and I'm going to choose the ideal research partner and you know, convince them to work with me. Uh, so sometimes it works that way. Other times, you, have a, you start out with a research partner, um, so, for example, maybe your friend has a company. Uh, maybe you're working on a project with your PhD advisor. Uh, and you start with the research partner, and then you kind of have to come up with an academically interesting research question to you. Uh, and so in my experience, uh, both, both things have happened before. So in a true partnership, you both bring something to the table. Um, you, as a researcher, are an expert in economic or behavioral economic theory. Um, for example, using a knowledge of theory to inform new treatments or policies. Uh, you're an expert on experimental design, um, going beyond the A-B tests that are often done in organizations, and an interpretation of results using econometrics. The research partner, on the other hand, also has expertise. So they're an expert in understanding their target audience, uh, whether you're doing an experiment with their customers, employees, or so on knowing the ins and outs of their organization, and in having the ability to bring research to practice. So earlier today, um, like a few minutes ago, uh, Julia talked about how important it was to understand context when you're doing experiments. Uh, so you should kind of rely on this partnership uh, and talk to your research partner uh, to understand context. Uh, so how do you identify a good research partner? Uh, this is often kind of the most important step. Uh, so here are some characteristics of a good research partner. Uh, you need a research partner that has uh, works on a sufficient scale. Uh, so operates on a large enough scale that you'll have enough of a sample size uh, where bigger is better. You want a research partner that's well-functioning. Uh, so a good research partner is well-functioning and competent so that they can implement an experiment without problems. Uh, it's important that the research partner has data that's ready to be used. Uh, so that means that they have a good data collection and management system and can easily share data with you. For example, they have the variables that you need. Um, so for example, I worked with a research partner uh, once that was very enthusiastic about running experiments, uh, and it seemed very promising. They were able to answer a lot of research questions I cared about. But when I asked for data, I realized that they were not systematically collecting data it didn't have a proper way to manage their data. Uh, so the first thing they needed was not to run a field experiment, but to receive some guidance about how to handle data. Uh, that's not to say they wouldn't be a great research partner in the future, uh, but in working with research partners like this one, there's a big setup cost before you can do an experiment. Uh, you want some stability in your research partner, uh, so both in staff turnover and in organization practices. Uh, this is relevant in working with government. Uh, sometimes there's turnover when different political parties are elected. Um, and if there's a lot of instability in organization practices, this is going to appear as noise in your data collection. 
The most important characteristic is a desire to know the truth and willingness to invest in uncovering it. So you want to know, are they able to experiment? Uh, that is randomized. The best research partners want to use an empirical approach to determine the organization's decisions. And also importantly, are they willing to publish results even if they're not ideal? Uh, so it's best to find this out at the very, very beginning of a research partnership. Um, it's rare to find a research partner that fits all of these characteristics. Um, you might have trade-offs. Um, the highlighted um, characteristic is the most important, in my opinion. If you don't have scale, you can try to run a few experiments in different contexts and combine it into one paper, or think about how to reduce the sample size you need. Uh, if the data is not ready to be used, you can help the organization with this before starting. If you don't have stability, you can try to understand the organization and get buy-in from as many people as possible. Uh, so you can control for time effects. If your contact person leaves, uh, you can make sure that there are others who support your project. Uh, Rachel Glenister has a good discussion of this in the Handbook of Ex Economic Field Experiments. Okay, so now assume that you've identified a great research partner to work with. So how do you actually convince them to work with you? Uh, you have to have the right ask. Uh, so here are a few considerations. Uh, first, who should you reach out to at the organization? You can either go top down or bottom up. So by top, I mean the top of the organization, uh, for example, the CEO. And the benefits of top down mean that means that getting buy-in from the top person in the organization, for example, the CEO, means that others will follow. However, you don't want to be in a situation where the boss hands the project down to someone below her and they're not happy to be stuck with the job. Uh, so benefits of bottom up. Uh, sometimes somewhere in the middle is best, uh, since they have autonomy and are more accessible than the top person. Okay, so then how technical should your language be? Uh, you should read the room. So if the organization has lots of PhDs or experimental design experts, you can be as technical as you want. Uh, so they probably want to be involved and are curious about this stuff. Um, it, otherwise, um, the organization might care more about direct results and might have less experience with experiments. Uh, there I would be a little more careful with your language. Um, so here's an example of some technical and non-technical language. Um, technical language would be using words like field experiment, RCT, randomized, sample size. Uh, there are a, a lot of organizations uh, where this language would work very well, uh, where people are very curious about designing experiments. Uh, for non-technical language, you would have uh, words like pilot, testing, program. You would say things like put people into groups with one group receiving X. Uh, and finally, you want to think about benefits. And this part is very important. So I'm going to cover it on the next slide. Okay. So in creating the right ask, you really want to think about how you're benefiting the research partner. Um, as a part research partnership, both of you should benefit. And one mistake I think I see a lot of uh, junior researchers doing is going to research partners with their own research question as a benefit. So most of us are altruistic and we care about contributing to science, but don't confuse your goals with your research partner's goals. Uh, so helping you with your research is not your research partner's job. Your research partner often has his or her own job with goals and responsibilities. They're busy people and you're asking them to take on extra work. So you really need to think about what you can offer them in return. Uh, often the best pitch is not the economic research question. This is the one that you care about. Uh, sometimes it's the policy question if it's some something the organization cares about, or it can be more direct benefits to the organization. So projects can have two research questions. Uh, for example, one economic research question for you uh, and one policy question for the organization. And I think the best pitch focuses on concrete benefits to the research partner. By this, I mean the organization itself, but also specifically the person you're reaching out to. So you should think about how you can make their job easier. And there are a lot of different things you can offer, uh, not limited to this list. Uh, so you can be creative. 
Um, for example, uh, some of the deliverables you can offer to an organization are um, maybe a solution to a problem the organization faces. You can often add questions to a survey and produce a survey report. Um, you can run a small experiment for the research partner, uh, something that they want to know the answer to uh, before doing a larger experiment. You can help implement a program, for example, training staff after the project is over. Or you can provide free academic expertise, uh, for example, with data analysis and consulting. Okay, so I'm going to use one of my papers as an example uh, to talk about how I've recruited research partners in the past. Uh, so this paper is a paper on pure effects and teenagers' decision making. Um, and it was uh, my job market paper when I was a PhD student um, at the University of Chicago. Um, so I was on the job market in 2019, and I ran this experiment in 2018. Uh, so I ran the experiment with uh, high schools in the Chicago suburbs. I reached out to about 60 high schools. I met with many, and I convinced three to work with me. So I spent a year recruiting high schools, and I learned a lot. Uh, so here is the letter that I used to recruit um, high schools to participate in my experiment. And so here you see I have the economic research question. It's, I wanted to disentangle pure effect channels in teenagers' educational decisions and understand how they're influenced by their peers. To do this, I created a program specifically to look at students' sign-up decisions, and I randomized whether they saw their peers' choices before signing up to the program. This was the economic research question. This is not what I started off with when I talked to schools. Uh, to schools, I told them that I'm running a program that helps students apply to college, and I want to understand how to motivate students to sign up. Uh, so this is something that schools really care about. Um, so I went with that policy question. Uh, so I actually created a program with a catchy name and logo. Uh, it's called App Coach. Uh, you can see this on the bottom right. And I asked a research assistant to design a logo. Uh, so who did I reach out to? So I sent this letter. Um, I've made a list of all the schools that fit my participation criteria around Chicago. And I recruited to the middle. So I sent cold emails to all principals, assistant uh, principals, and college counselors at these schools. I felt that recruiting to the middle was very helpful. Uh, so the principals were really effective. Uh, they have a lot of autonomy in their schools, and they can uh, choose to participate in a program or not. I think this wouldn't have worked as well if I had recruited uh, superintendents uh, because they would have been in charge of many schools, but then I would have had to get buy-in from the principals too. Uh, so I sent these emails to the schools, uh, and when they responded, the next step was to meet to talk more about the App Coach program. Uh, so you can see how technical is my language. It was not at all. Uh, and the benefits that I offered to the schools were I had a free program to help students apply to college. And in subsequent meetings and materials, I also emphasized that schools would receive all the resources and materials from the program. They would receive a packet with student survey responses uh, when you do this. Uh, if you do this, you need to make sure this is okay with the IRB. Uh, and a report summarizing insights that I learned from the project. Okay, I have a question. I'm going to leave that to the end, I think. Okay. So uh, experimental design has been covered by a lot of the other talks in the workshop. Uh, but here's some tips about experimental design in terms of working with research partners. Uh, so one tip is to integrate into what is already taking place. Uh, that makes it easier for everybody, uh, which means that it's more likely to take place. So it minimizes disruption and it's cheaper for the organization. It also makes it more natural. Uh, so people might not realize that they're in an experiment if it's a natural field experiment, which minimizes experimental demand effects. Also, uh, that means that uh, your experiment is closer to policy, so more policy relevant, and it's less work for you. Uh, you wanna be flexible. Uh, so you wanna work with the organization to design treatments. A lot of the time, organizations like to have input in an experiment, and you should use their expertise. Uh, they understand the context best, and they might have insights. Uh, sometimes organizations may have preferences. Uh, so I think uh, Jared and Julia have both talked about this earlier today. 
Uh, so for example, what if they want the control group to receive something as well? Uh, so Julia covered phase in designs, for example. So you should work with the organization and see what are their preferences uh, and try to meet them to the extent that you can uh, without sacrificing the integrity of your study. Um, power, uh, you should use the data, use data from the organization to conduct a power test. Uh, don't run an underpowered experiment. Uh, and think about ways that you can reduce the sample size if you need. Um, since, you know, with a research partner, you might not have so much choice over your sample size uh, if you have constraints there. Uh, so you might think about maybe getting at mechanisms with a survey instead of additional treatments, for example. Okay, so here's uh, tips on how to organize a field experiment. Uh, so once you have a research partner uh, and you've convinced them to work with you, now you have to manage the field experiment. Uh, so every uh, research partnership needs a point of contact. Uh, so who do you email when you need something? From the organization side, you should figure out who your main contact is. So the best is someone with decision-making power who's excited about your research uh, and not too busy, so maybe not the CEO. From your team side, you want one person to communicate with the organization, otherwise it gets confusing and they don't know who to email or communicate with. I found it helpful for some research partners to have that person on your team visit in person one time a week, if that's what the research partner wants and if it's okay with COVID. Um, and then it's easy for the person to get integrated with the research partner's team, uh, keep track of changes in the organization and have regular fixed meetings. Uh, so I've been that contact person who do, did that um, in the past. Uh, you want to understand the organization. Uh, so you want to keep track of the politics, incentives, and constraints uh, of the organization. This helps you understand how to sell the project, who to go to for different things, and how to push for things to get done. And you also want to be a nice person to work with. Uh, so people are more likely to enjoy working with you if you're a nice person. Um, you can be social, uh, so you can, for example, go to research partner team happy hours. Uh, in the past, I've gone bowling with research partners, um, and um, terrible at bowling, but um, I've been to bowling happy hours. Um, you want to understand the risks. Um, so field experiments are risky. Um, they're very risky, and uh, for example, I'd be careful using one as your job market paper. Um, it's hard to control the research partner wants, uh, timing, external shocks, or you might even have pandemics like COVID. Um, and so I think if you want to do a field experiment, it's best to have backup projects. Uh, for example, if you have a field experiment job market paper and to work quickly. Um, you should always offer to reduce the workload when you can um, and always offer to do the randomization and the analysis. Uh, so on the one hand, you're reducing the research partner's workload, which means that uh, your experiment is more likely to be done. Uh, and also, it's just really important to get this part right as the researcher. Um, you want to manage expectations. Uh, so make sure that everybody is clear about what to expect at the beginning of a project. Uh, so at the beginning of the project, it's good to get an MOU and NDA. Uh, so make sure uh, before investing so much time, that the research partner agrees with the main requirements of your experiment. Um, also be clear about the responsibilities and who's going to be doing what. And be clear about deadlines and timeline of deliverables. Uh, so I like to make a calendar with to do's for the research partner and for me and my team. I'm going to show you an example of this on the next page. Um, and when you're making sure you're on the same page about deadlines, uh, when things need to be done, Sometimes research partners don't realize how long academic studies take. Uh, so you want to think about what you can offer when and if you can offer any intermediate outputs before the final paper is ready. Uh, so be professional. This one's self-explanatory. Um, and you want to follow up at the end of the study. Uh, so this can either be a written report or a meeting in person. Uh, it's important to make sure you deliver on all your promises on time. Um, because a good and happy research partnership may lead to another project or partnership in the future, and if things go badly, it could generate negative spillovers to you or other researchers. Uh, so here's another example of a calendar that I like to make with to-dos and deadlines uh, for the research partner and for myself. Um, so this is from the same paper. 
I met with high schools and I made sure all the dates and meetings were on their calendar and rooms were booked. And then they could refer to this calendar throughout the field experiment. So we could both make sure that we were on track. Um, as you can see, I was all set to collect data in March 2020 uh, when COVID happened. Uh, and the pic on the left is me teaching kids how to write college essays in my program. So delivering on the promise. Okay, that's it. Uh, so to continue the conversation, uh, you can email me um, or ask questions in the Q&A um, or find me on Twitter. Okay, um, so slides are down and I'm going to answer, I'm gonna answer this question that I have. Uh, oh, Jared's answering. Um, do you have any tips on how to convince partners that our properly designed experiment is superior to simple A, B approaches that many development organizations use. And could you please say something about sharing the costs of experiments with partners? What costs should we expect partners to cover? These are great questions. Um, so it is hard to convince partners uh, to do an experiment over uh, an A, B test. A lot of organizations do A, B tests, but that's precisely where economists actually have the advantage. Um, so, you know, organizations can often do A-B tests on their own, but we actually, as economists, have the expertise to be able to go beyond A-B tests. So we can design experiments with, um, you know, with theories behind them to test theory. Uh, we can design experiments um, to be able to disentangle mechanisms to answer why and how treatments work. I think these all go beyond A-B tests. Um, and um, are really helpful for organizations. So you wanna emphasize kind of things that you can do that the organization can't. Um, also, I think in terms of econometrics, sometimes uh, we have more training there. Um, can you please say something about sharing the cost of experiments with partners? What cost should we expect partners to cover? Um, if you're integrating your experiment into the partner's practice, often they will cover the cost without you having to pay much, uh, for example, emailing their customers or employees with a survey. Um, so often that's kind of a cheap way to get a field experiment done. I think anything that's specifically for your experiment that they wouldn't have done, that you would have to expect to cover. Um, so um, maybe sometimes survey incentives. Um, but yeah, I think it really depends on the research question, it depends on the project and the partner and how important it is to them that the question is answered. Okay. If your partners cannot hold tight the randomized sampling and end up having gaps, can you do an ex post stratification? It's always better to do things ex ante, I think, with experiments. Um, so I think Julia wants to answer um, this because it has to do with randomization. Uh, that's... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, yeah, ex post certification, I wouldn't know how you would do that because, I mean, it's about your know, randomization um, assignment. Um, and, yeah, that's, I think the, that first part of the question is really important, right? Because that's something that Karen was talking about extensively to say, whenever you work with somebody, I think it's super important to make sure that your partner actually knows what they are supposed to do and that you are, like, closely with them when they um, <clears throat> implement a randomization strategy or a sampling um, so that those things don't happen. Because, you know, if it's like one or two people out of a thousand, then you're not having a big problem if something goes wrong. Um, and most likely your, your, your project is still fine. But I mean, those are things that can easily um, make a project not publishable or, or failed. So I would be really careful there. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, just to add to that, that's why one of the tips was to offer to do the randomization yourself to the extent that you can, uh, because you want to make sure when you're writing that paper that you know how the randomization happens. Um, and so, you know, if you can ask for data from the partner and do the randomization yourself and tell them, you know, these are the people who are supposed to get treatment A versus treatment B, that would be, um, that would be good. Also, I think it's important to, uh, to pilot um, even for what seem like simple experiments, because then it becomes clear what they're not capable of doing and what they are capable of doing, and that will help you design a larger study better. So remember to do that. All right.
right, if there are no other questions, I think that concludes the workshop today. Um, so you guys were really great. Um, you guys had really good questions throughout the day. I hope this was useful for you guys. Um, does anyone else have anything else to say? No, th thank you so much uh, for all the participants. It really it was a, a great workshop and uh, well, thank you to all and well, and, and thank you so much to, to Carolina Bajon uh, for the, the great work of, of, of putting together all the logistics so that we were able to, to have the, the workshop in, the, in, in a very good way. And uh, as Carolina mentioned, the, uh, uh, the, the, we recorded and it will be available. Uh, so, well, uh, uh, thank you so much. And I don't know if uh, Carolina would you like to say something or Julia, Jared, I don't know. Uh, and well, and we look forward now for the, this is only the beginning. Now we have the ESA meeting. I think that, uh, again, it, it, it will be really exciting. We have a great keynote speaker, great papers, uh, really uh, great paper, experimental papers. Uh, so uh, thank you again. I don't know, Carolina, Julia, Jared. No, the, the only note is that the recordings are going to be available on our YouTube channel uh, uh, next Monday. So we we will email you with the, with the link to our YouTube channel. That's all. Okay, so see you next year. <laughs> all the best. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>